Hi, I'm Deidre Hunter. I'm an astronomer here at Lowell Observatory. And today I'd like to tell you uh, the story about how stars are made. Um, it's really an amazing process. Um, stars are made from the gas of atoms and, and other and dust and stuff between the stars in galaxies. And um, the typical density of the, of the interstellar medium, that, that gas between the stars, is about one atom per cubic centimeter. And the temperature is about 50 to 100 uh, degrees Kelvin. And the process by which stars form out of that gas results in um, a star like our sun, which at the core has a density of uh, 100 million billion billion uh, atoms per cubic centimeter and a temperature a million times that of the general interstellar medium. And so it's, it's an amazing process. Um, it's also a very uh, important process to galaxy, uh, galaxies because it's a major way in which they uh, change and evolve over time. Uh, first of all, as the gas is formed into stars, um, it becomes more and more depleted as the, as the galaxy goes along. And also the stars um, produce, uh, um, they have nuclear fusion going on in their centers and so they um, convert hydrogen to helium and, and um, those atoms to uh, all the heavier elements like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. Um, and just a footnote, astronomers call any atom heavier than helium a metal. So I'll talk about metallicity. Um, but um, so, and also dust, there's dust in the interstellar medium and dust is made in the outer parts of cool stars like red giants. Um, and so the dust and the heavier elements are spewed back out into the interstellar medium as the stars uh, evolve through their winds and as when they explode at the end of their lifetimes. And so over time, the interstellar medium and the galaxy becomes more and more polluted. And that actually has a major effect on the star formation process itself. Um, so let's just talk for a few minutes about galaxies since that's what I'm interested in. <laughs> um, there are sort of three basic types of galaxies. There are elliptical galaxies, spirals, and dwarf irregulars. Um, and these pictures illustrate these three types and uh, rough, show roughly the relative sizes, typical relative sizes of galaxies. The elliptical galaxies shown over here on the left are, um, uh, are very large generally, and they um, also uh, are triaxial in shape. And that means that they are um, sort of shaped like a hard boiled egg. The spiral galaxies and the dwarf galaxies um, are disk galaxies. And so if you look at them face on, they're round, but if you look at them edge on, they are a thin, a thin disk. And um, the uh, spiral galaxies are very beautiful because of their spiral pattern. And so they're, they're kind of like, they're kind of like uh, fried eggs because they're thin and then they have the yolk or the nucleus in the center. And then the, the dwarf irregular galaxies are the scrambled eggs of this egg sequence. Um, the elliptical galaxies uh, form by the merger of spiral galaxies. And so uh, that's why they get to be so large because they're merging these other large galaxies together. And the process by which two galaxies merge, that they're gravitationally pulled together and um, they go through this beautiful dance. Um, you can see over here in this picture, the antenna galaxies are going through this um, process of merging and um, they form these tidal tails. And the, the body of the, the, the two galaxies that are, that are merging here, they are full of gas to start with. And that gas shocks um, when the galaxies gravitationally collide. And that produces clouds uh, in the interstellar medium of the, the system. And those clouds 
then um, form stars. And so this process can result in a huge starburst uh, where the whole system just lights up with star formation and, and thousands of, of star clusters can be born in a very short period of time. And the result is that the gas is depleted very quickly. And so um, that's why elliptical galaxies have very little gas and very little star formation today. Uh, uh, it's not zero, but it's uh, not very much. Mostly we think of elliptical galaxies as red and dead. Their stars are one by one dying off. Um, spiral galaxies, on the other hand, began forming stars when they first themselves formed, and they've been forming stars continuously, more or less, ever since. Um, the Milky Way, for example, uh, turns a pro on average um, three times the mass of our sun worth of gas into uh, stars every year. Um, the, the stars that form in a star forming region cover a whole range of masses. It can be from eight hundredths the mass of the sun up to hundreds of mass times the mass of the sun. But on average, a half a dozen or so stars are formed every year in the Milky Way. Now the gas density, as I said, is very low in the generally in the interstellar medium, one atom per cubic centimeter, but the volume of the Milky Way is huge, and the result is that the Milky Way has enough gas to continue forming stars for another 60 billion years or more, so four more times the current age of the universe. And then there are the little tiny dwarf galaxies. This is what I study, so we're going to talk more about them. This, uh, this is the galaxy here, and this star and these other stars around the galaxy are stars in the Milky Way. They're just in the way. But you can, this galaxy is close enough that you can begin to resolve it into individual stars. You can see that modeled appearance. So how do we know that there are young stars in galaxies? Well, if we look at this dwarf, this picture of the dwarf galaxy, you see these clumps of blue stars, these clumps that are blue. We know that those are young, young star clusters. Um, as I said, in a star forming region, you make stars of all different masses, but the massive stars uh, in particular are very hot, they're very blue, they're very bright, and they don't live very long. Uh, the the um, most massive stars only live a few million years. So if you see them in these star clusters and associations, you know that stars have formed there fairly recently by extragalactic standards. Um, so that's one clue. And then the other clue comes from the nebulae in the galaxy. This process by which a cloud of gas turns into stars isn't very efficient. Um, only about 10% of the cloud of the gas actually becomes stars and the rest is left over. And so that, the, those, that ultraviolet light coming from those hot massive stars in particular ionizes that leftover gas around the stars and produces the nebulae that are so photogenic and beautiful in galaxies. So this picture on the uh, right is a picture of this same galaxy, but now taken through a filter that only passes the light from the nebulae. And so this arc uh, of uh, emission over here is associated with this uh, clump of young stars and this, uh, this complex of nebula and filaments are associated with this and so forth. So you can take a picture um, through an emission line that comes from the nebulae and those act as signposts for star formation uh, it, throughout the galaxy and you can also quantify how much star formation is going on. Another way for galaxies that are close enough by is just to measure the brightnesses and the colors of individual stars. So this, this little tiny irregular galaxy, this is called Leo T, and this is the galaxy I'm putting, running my cursor around here. Um, this tiny little galaxy only has 300,000 stars in it. Um, compare that to the Milky Way that has 300 billion stars in it. 
And so uh, it's not close enough by uh, um, uh, that we can we can see the individual stars and people have measured the colors and the brightnesses of those stars and placed them on these diagrams. The grayscale image is the image of where the stars are falling on the on the diagram. And then the lines are stellar evolutionary tracks that people compare the location of the stars to, to figure out how old the stars are and also what their metallicities are. Um, and so this galaxy has old stars and it also has youngish stars. So even though it only has 300,000 stars in it and is really tiny, it has made multiple generations of stars. So how do stars form? Well, stars form out of clouds in the interstellar medium. And we will come back to that process of how the clouds form. But first let's talk about what happens once you have a cloud that forms. And the closest uh, one to the earth is the Orion molecular cloud complex. And I think this is a this is one of the most beautiful pictures uh, in astronomy. This picture shows on the left is showing the uh, Orion molecular cloud complex. The, uh, the molecular cloud complex is behind the constellation. Otherwise, because it's opaque, we wouldn't see the constellation. But these four stars are the stars that we recognize as the body of the Orion constellation. This is his belt and this is his sword. And in this, um, in this uh, complex, there are actually two molecular clouds. Now, most of the gas in the interstellar medium are hydrogen atoms. And what happens is that once a cloud forms, it begins to be pulled together just by the force of gravity of its own mass. And it, and it gets denser and it gets cooler. Um, densities can be up to a thousand molecules per cubic centimeter. And it gets cooler, the temperature is dropped down at 10 to 20 degree Kelvin. And in the process, the hydrogen atoms become hydrogen molecules. So most of the gas that's actually in the, the um, cloud uh, is molecular. And that's why they're called molecular clouds. Um, most of the gas is hydrogen atoms, um, but there are all sorts of other weird molecules. Uh, uh, carbon monoxide uh, turns out to be very important to this story. And um, there's formaldehyde and alcohol and all sorts of other complex molecules can be found in smaller quantities. Um, and so, the two molecular clouds in this particular complex are about 100,000 times the mass of the sun, and they formed several thousands of um, stars over the last few million years. And this part, this little part of the cloud, um, which uh, you can actually see as a fuzzy patch uh, in a, if you, by eye, just by eye, um, if you're in a dark place, um, is actually the Orion Nebula, shown here on the right. And a group of stars have formed right in here in the nebula. And the massive stars that formed have ionized the gas left over around it pr to produce the nebula, which is just this little blip on this huge molecular cloud complex. Well, um, this is a sketch of the process that happens in the cloud. Um, you form the cloud. The cloud is contracting under the force of gravity and it's cooling. And um, then pieces of it inside the cloud fragment and become little balls that then continue to contract under the force of their own gravity. And so this is supposed to be one of those fragments. And then eventually, it's get and it's getting because it's contracting. It's getting denser and denser and denser, and um, eventually, in the center, in this case, the little ball can't cool, and instead, it's getting hotter and hotter in the center, and um, eventually, you reach this stage, which is the um, protostar stage, where you have this ball of gas in the center, and then there's 
a, a disk of leftover junk uh, around the star. And it's in this disk around the star that uh, that's where the planets form if they form. And then eventually the protostar reaches this stage, which is the pre-main sequence stage. And the um, pre-main sequence stage, the star is still contracting and it hasn't yet begun nuclear fusion, um, but it's getting hotter and hotter in the center. Um, uh, when, our <laughs> when our daughter was very little, we read these baby books and uh, the baby books would talk about uh, the unsettled baby in the first, it takes a couple of months after baby is born for it to become a settled baby. So I think of the pre-main sequence phase as the unsettled baby phase of the star. It hasn't quite figured out the nuclear fusion business, but it's getting there. And then after a while, it finally settles down into equilibrium, that is the star, and the force of gravity making the star contract is balanced by the nuclear fusion now going on the center that's producing a pressure outward. And so it settles down to do nuclear fusion in an equilibrium state. And that's the phase it's called, um, uh, the star is now called a main sequence star. So after the stars form, um, what's left? Well, now you have, the newly formed stars. Um, and the stars put out a lot of ultraviolet light. They have winds, they explode, they do all sorts of messy things. And the result is that um, the cloud, the leftover cloud out of which it formed disperses into the interstellar medium and is, and is gone. Um, and so what you're left with then are the young stars. Um, if the stars form, if you have a, a, a large mass in a small, um, um, on a high density mass of stars, um, then the star the gravity can uh, keep the stars together. And this is an, a, a picture of one of the globular clusters associated with the Milky Way. The globular clusters are very, very massive star, uh, clusters. They have about a million stars in them typically. And they're very old. They formed when the uh, galaxy itself was young. Um, so they're 10 to 12 billion years old. And they are so massive and dense that that today we still see them as a um, as a as a as a, a unit, a star cluster. Most of the stars that form, however, today are forming in the Milky Way, are forming in these young, in these um, looser. Uh, Cons looser uh, OB associations. There aren't as many stars, they aren't as dense. And so gravity there's, doesn't keep them together. And so once they form, again, the stars are all rotating about the center of the galaxy, but they also have random motions associated with them with respect to that overall motion. And so they wander off into the stellar disk. And so the sun's siblings, have done that, they've wandered off and we don't know who they are anymore. Um, so one of the things that's very interesting is that um, if we look at the process of star formation and cloud formation in the Milky Way, we see that um, dust and heavy, the metals, the heavy elements, especially the carbon, for example, play an important role in uh, the molecular cloud and in the star formation. And yet there are places, even nearby places, uh, where the metallicity is much lower, the amount of carbon is much lower, the amount of dust is much lower. And this is especially true in the dwarf irregular galaxies that I study. Um, and so let's look for a minute at the effect of the low metallicity on the star formation process. And this is a sketch of a molecular cloud. And on the left uh, here, we have a picture of a cloud as you would find it in the Milky Way today in our neighborhood of the sun. And that is the, the central region of the cloud, this dark, uh, this dark part, that's the molecular core. And that's where the stars are forming. And what happens is, 
that this cloud that is formed is sitting in this disk of stars. It's being bathed in ultraviolet light, for example. And those ultraviolet photons break up the hydrogen molecule of the cloud, but they can only get in so far. And so um, they, they only get in so far. And then um, uh, they the outer part, so the outer part of the cloud is stopping this, the, um, the ultraviolet light from penetrating any further into the cloud. So the outer part, this shell called the photodissociation region, this shell is protecting, this serves to protect the molecular core in the interior from being dissociated. Um, I, there's a question here I should answer before we go on. What happens if there is not enough material for the star to complete the fusion stage? Will it remain at any of the formation stages? Um, so a star that doesn't have enough mass to become, uh, to have nuclear fusion going on inside of it, um, um, those are stars that are lower than about eight hundredths the mass of the sun. We call them brown dwarfs. And so they're just sitting there. They're, they exist, but they're not, they're not, they don't have nuclear fusion going on inside. What causes a failed star to form? I've heard some people refer to Jupiter as a failed star. Well, it's not so much failed, it's just too tiny. And it's just too tiny for nuclear fusion to take place in the center. It can't get hot enough for that to start. And so the brown dwarfs and the Jupiters and so forth, they're, um, they've, um, they just aren't massive enough for nuclear fusion to go on. And nuclear fusion is what we, is one of the key definitions of a, of a star. So, um, so in this molecular cloud, um, the problem is that the, it's the dust and, and especially carbon that, um, that are absorbing the ultraviolet photons. And so if you don't have as much, the ultraviolet photons can penetrate further into the cloud and uh, disrupt more of the cloud. And so what happens, this is now, if you have lower metallicity, the shell becomes thicker, it's bigger, and the core becomes is smaller because the ultraviolet photons have penetrated further into the cloud. And so this is what should be going on in dwarf galaxies. Um, so um, um, Monica Rubio and uh, Bruce Elmigren and their collaborators, including myself, set out to look at this in a dwarf galaxy. What does a molecular cloud look like in a dwarf galaxy? Now, one of the bummers about molecular hydrogen is that you can't observe it directly. And so it, and it's a symmetrical molecule and it just doesn't give off an emission line in the cold, uh, in the cold environments of molecular cores. So we can't see the major molecule that makes up the, uh, the cloud. So we have to use the other molecules that form as tracers. And the, the one that people use, especially in other galaxies, is carbon monoxide, CO, um, which to me is really bizarre, but there it is. Um, and so we use that as a tracer um, of the molecular core. And then um, the, one of the strongest emission lines coming from the skin of the, of the, molec of the molecular cloud is, uh, is ionized carbon. This is carbon two, ionized carbon. It gives off an emission line at 158 uh, microns. So it's in the far infrared, but we can take pictures with far infrared telescopes. And that's what we did. We used the Herschel Far Infrared Telescope to take pictures of this one star forming region in the, this, in the galaxy. And we used the ALMA radio interferometer in the Atacama Desert in Chile to uh, map the molecular gas in, the, in CO. And this, and this is the galaxy we observed. This is WLM. It's a little, a tiny dwarf galaxy in our local group of galaxies. It has an abundance of only 13% of the sun. And this is the region I'm going to talk to you, show you about. So this picture, the uh, orange picture, 
is a picture of the carbon uh, emission, the emission coming from the carbon atoms that are, have been ionized in the protective, the photodissociation region, that protective shell around the outer part of the uh, uh, cloud. And then these little tiny green contours, those outline the little tiny CO nuggets that we detected with Alma. So this is a peak and this is a peak and in between is this depression. So it, this, this is like a bowl. And um, in the bowl is where we find these little CO nuggets. So it matches this qualitatively, <laughs> matches this picture of a, of a cloud in which you have a very thick um, uh, region of the uh, photodissociation region and this very, uh, this small molecular core in the center. And all that seems to make sense compared to these pictures, but there's an issue that I, I wanna share with you that disturbs me. So I uh, this picture over here is a, on the right is now a picture of the far ultraviolet emission coming from the region. And so these blobs, these, these blobs of far ultraviolet light, those are the young stars that have formed in here. And on top of this picture, I put the same circles and the same green contours so that you can see what we're, compare this picture to that picture. We know that with these little green contours, the CO nuggets, that there's more uh, mo molecular hydrogen associated with it than, than we can see. But nevertheless, I look at these blobs that are the young stars, and I think there has to be, there has to be more molecular hydrogen out of which these stars are forming than we see based on just the CO which is just an, uh, the beginning of uh, the, this, um, to uh, illustrate this idea of dark gas. This has nothing to do with dark matter or dark energy or any of the other dark things that astronomers like to talk about. This is dark gas, meaning we know what it is, that it's molecular hydrogen, but it isn't traced by CO. So it's there but we don't have any way of seeing it direct, seeing it even indirectly, at least not, not with CO. And so we'll come back to this. This could become very important in understanding how dwarf irregular galaxies form stars. So now let's go one step further. We've talked about the dwarf galaxies where ha that have low metallicities, but now let's just talk briefly about the first stars, the very first stars that formed after the Big Bang when there were no metals, there was no carbon, there was no dust because those are made by stars. So, so there were no stars yet to have made them. This is a picture of a, um, the timeline of the universe. This is the Big Bang over here on the left. Here is now on the right. Here is her galaxies have formed. And um, um, a group of astronomers um, uh, a couple of years ago uh, looked for the signature of the coming from the first stars. It's actually, it's an absorption signature seen against the cosmic microwave background. And they found this signature and they found it at a frequency corresponding to a redshift corresponding to an age of 180 million years after the Big Bang. So we have some observational evidence then that the first stars formed at that time in the universe, the universe's timeline. Now we can't see the formation directly, so people turn to computer simulations. They put in the physics. They um, people have these uh, cosmological simulations that start with the Big Bang and they evolve the universe. And in this, they can study how what they think happens when um, the first stars formed. Um, so this is a, these panes are from uh, simulations by Abel and company. 
and um, time runs from the left to the right. And the bottom panes are pictures of the dark matter and the top panes are pictures of the hydrogen gas. So uh, one thing that the, the simulations show is, um, um, is that um, the dark matter forms into these filamentary structures forming what people call the cosmic web. And you can see that in these uh, panes here. And the, the, um, where the webs cross at the nodes, there's more, there's a lot of mass and they pull the, the hydrogen and helium atoms into those places. And that's the, the, uh, the gas piles up there and that's where you form the, star, the galaxies and the first stars. So now there's something that's very interesting about this is that um, the genes mass is the minimum mass that a clump of gas must have in order to collapse under its own gravity. Um, and this genes mass goes up as the temperature goes up. So the hotter your blob of your cloud of gas, the more mass you have to have in order for gravity to be able to pull it together. And that's what you have to have in order to make a star. And so the, the clouds, back then, the first clouds, only had molecular hydrogen to cool them. And so they, they um, we believe uh, from what we see today that the molecular hydrogen couldn't cool below um, 200 Kelvin. So the clouds were hotter than the molecular clouds that we have today. And that means the genes mass was much higher. And that means that so, what people think is that the very that the first stars were very massive stars, maybe 250 to 1,000 times the mass of the sun. And so these very massive stars, um, um, they, they have nuclear fusion going on inside. They're making all these elements, but they don't live very long um, because they go through their, um, their uh, their, their uh, energy source very quickly. And um, so they would have polluted, they would have exploded a supernovae and polluted the surrounding gas very quickly in just a few million years. So it was hard for those first stars, mass, first stars to form, but the second generation, which has the benefit of those heavier atoms, like carbon, could form faster and also could form in clouds that were cooler and so form more stars that more the masses that we're used to. Um, I have a question. Do you think any of the first stars had planets? Um, um, the answer is no. These, these very, very first stars um, could not have had planets because um, the um, because there was nothing with which to make the planets except hydrogen and helium. I don't know about making gas giants, but they couldn't have made Earth's um, rocky planets because they, did, they didn't have the, the heavy atoms to do it with. Um, then, um, but uh, you say, let's see, I read that astronomers recently found gaseous planets near a very old star. Um, and that's uh, possible. Gas, it would have to be a gas planet that would, um, that would be just hydrogen and helium. Um, and to, but um, one, once you start polluting the interstellar medium, then you can start making um, um, other planets. And I have a question, what does Z represent in this figure? Uh, that's the redshift. So Z equals zero is now. And I don't, off the top of my head, I can't convert Z to time, but this is, this is Z equals 100 is very, very early in the age of the universe. So that brings us to the question, which I think is actually the most, a very interesting question is, what causes the cloud formation in the first place? And the re reason that this is interesting is um, because that, and, um, that is sort of the bottleneck uh, for a, a, a star formation to take place in a galaxy. So the first, um, you have to form a cloud and then 
from my extra galactic point of view. Once you form a cloud, it goes on to form stars and everything is fine. But you have to make that cloud in the first place. And there are a few problems. I'll have to come back to the next question later. Um, and this illustrates the problem. So this is a picture of an edge on spiral. And um, as you go from this, in the center of the spiral galaxy outward, the gas density falls off. So it's high in the center, and this is supposed to illustrate how it drops off and then density drops off. Well, um, in the 1960s, people looked at um, the uh, uh, models of disks of gas uh, rotating, uh, and uh, they found that the um, if the gas density, there's a critical gas density, and if the gas density in a galaxy is greater than that critical density, then it's unstable. And we call this the gravitational instability. And it will, frag it will, call it will fragment into clouds um, just because it's unstable. And the central parts of uh, spiral galaxies uh, have gas densities that are above that critical density. So we think, okay, this helps explain how you can make clouds easily in the central regions of spirals. But in the, in the outer parts of spirals and pretty much anywhere in a dwarf irregular galaxy, the gas densities are too low. The gas densities are below that critical density. And so the gas density, um, and so the gas is stable. And so it won't fragment into clouds just, um, because it's unstable. And so we have to find other ways to make the clouds. Now, this brings us first back to this issue of um, the dark gas in dwarf galaxies. Um, and uh, there are people, Suzanne Madden, Bruce Elmergren, and others who, and Mark Krumholtz, who are, are arguing that there could be gas in uh, places like the central regions of dwarf galaxies that um, are, is molecular, but we can't see it because we can't, we can't detect CO related to it. But if you take the star formation activity seen in the interior parts of dwarf galaxies, and you ask what is the molecular gas we might expect to be there, and you add that then to the atomic gas, it brings up the density of the gas so that it, it is um, um, approximately unstable and could, and so gravitational instability could work and you could fragment uh, the gas into clouds. Um, but we don't have any way of observing that. We just think it might be happening. But there's still star formation going on in the outer parts of dwarf galaxies and spiral galaxies um, where this isn't going to, this, this magic trick won't work. And so I want to tell you about three possible mechanisms that might help make clouds in regions where you can't make them in other ways. And one is by stellar feedback. So when you make a bunch of stars, um, though, and I, I'm, I've mentioned that the massive stars in particular are very messy, they have strong winds, they explode, they do all that kind of stuff. They can actually blow a hole in the gas in galaxies. So this picture on the this picture on the right is a picture of the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's an irregular galaxy, and the uh, green is is just the atomic hydrogen gas, the interstellar medium of the galaxy, and the uh, red is the are the nebulae, the ionized gas. So we're going to look at this region here, this hole. You can see it better over here on the left. Um, this is a huge hole in the gas that was formed when star formation took place over this whole little, this whole region here about 15 million years ago. And the massive stars blew a hole in the gas. Well, when you do that, you pile the gas up into a shell around the hole. Well, now when you pile the gas up, you, um, you now have higher density. And so now, you can more easily form clouds that that will form that process of, of, of shocking the gas and piling it up increasing the density is going to make clouds and so in the shell the second generation of stars will form 
And that's why this shell has yellow and red um, in it because that's where young stars have formed nebulae in the shell. We know this process takes place because we can take pictures of it. We can see it um, very directly. And um, so uh, Pakro um, did his PhD thesis using our data on dwarf irregular galaxies. And he, he looked at all of the shells and all of the little, uh, of all the dwarf galaxies in our sample. And he concluded that um, there, that while Sometimes you can, you can make some of the stars that are forming in the galaxies in this way. It doesn't necessarily account even for the majority of the star formation. So it happens, but it, we, have to look for, we have to look elsewhere for other ways of doing making clouds. So another, the second mechanism I wanna share with you is turbulence, by which I just mean random motions in the gas. Uh, spiral, this is just a picture from a computer simulation because I didn't know how else to, to illustrate turbulence. But um, so the gas in spiral galaxies and in dwarf galaxies is uh, moving randomly. It's moving, it's rotating around the center of the galaxy, but there are also random motions that we just call lump all together and call turbulence. Well, if you have random motions, then you can occasionally make a cloud. You'll randomly make a cloud just by, you have a higher density of gas that just happens to collect in one region, and then gravity takes over and pulls it together into a cloud. Once you have a cloud, you can form stars. Um, we've looked at this in um, several different ways, and we think, and here are some references down here, here that we think that this process could be important in galaxies, but um, we've looked at the turbulence in, for example, the dwarf, we ourselves have looked in dwarf irregular galaxies, trying to understand if we could see the connection between star formation and turbulence, and we have not succeeded in doing that yet. We have to find some other way of looking at the problem. And then the third and final, um, uh, thing I wanted to share with you, um, possibility, is I call it cosmic rain. The um, official term is uh, cold accretion of uh, gas. Um, and I, I talked, this is a picture from the Millennium Simulation, and it is uh, one of these cosmological simulations of the formation of the, what happens after the Big Bang, formation of the universe. And all, this is a picture of the dark matter distribution in the simulation. And um, it, that's the cosmic web that I was talking about. Well, the gas piles up in these concentrations of dark matter and in the chaos, the galaxies form. And, but the simulators, the people who do these simulations, at least most of them are arguing that this accretion of gas onto galaxies that originally formed the galaxies, this accretion of gas onto galaxies is still going on today. This picture on the right is an artist's um, picture, conception of this process. I've since learned that um, the um, actual filamentary structures in the simulations are, are much, much bigger than single galaxies. They're more like the size of groups of clusters of galaxies. But the idea is that this gas is still accreting onto galaxies. And there are people who argue um, that this accretion onto the outer parts of spiral galaxies accounts for the star formation going on out there in spiral galaxies. Well, if it's happening to spiral galaxies, it should also happen to dwarf galaxies. Um, we um, um, looked at this in our uh, data of the gas in dwarf galaxies, and we, we couldn't find uh, any evidence that it's uh, taking place. Um, on the other hand, the amount of gas falling onto the galaxies could be low enough that we couldn't detect it with our data. And so people have to find, we'll have to find some other way to try and detect it. At this point, this ongoing accretion has not been seen directly. 
So that brings me to the end of what I have to say. Um, to me, this process by which this gas in galaxies turns into stars is um, beautiful, elegant, and a very complicated process. It's very important in the evolution of galaxies, um, but um, also there, there are things we don't understand about it because stars are forming in places that we don't understand how, how that happens. And so um, there's still a lot to learn. And so with that, I will answer any other questions. Um, there was one question here. What is the physical region, reason for hydrogen's inability to completely cool? Um, and um, uh, what I was saying was that in the molecular cloud, if it's just hydrogen molecules, um, th the cooling that takes place by the um, hydrogen molecules um, getting excited and then giving off a photon that escapes from the cloud so that the cloud cools. It's just not very efficient in, um, uh, a, a, not a very efficient process in the cloud. And so that's, that's why there's sort of this limit of 200 Kelvin um, is just an, an efficiency issue. Um, do you know what the dust is made of? Um, there are two kinds of dust particles. Actually, there are several kinds of dust particles. One's made of silicates and one's made of uh, carbon um, uh, uh, compounds. And um, then there's something called polycyclic pause, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are, uh, have been described as sort of a tar-like thing. The answer is beyond that, no. <laughs> I don't I don't understand us. Is there a specific question related to your interest in research which you think the capabilities of the James Webb telescope would allow you to answer? Well, um, I hope I hope my competitors aren't listening. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that uh, I want to write a proposal. So proposals for the first cycle of observations are due in November. And I and my colleagues, would like to write a proposal to use uh, JWST to observe those those little CO nuggets that are in that we found in uh, that star forming region in WLM. Those they were outlined by the little green contours. We want to observe those in the infrared so that to see what's going on inside of them. Are they forming st are stars? And if so, you know, what kind of masses of stars are forming there? Um, so that's what I want to use w JWST for right now. Um, please explain the 50 to 100K temperature of atoms in space more fully. Is it a measure of their kinetic energy? I was under the impression that empty space was at or near zero degrees. Um, um, it's just a, a thermal energy. And um, as I said, there's turbulence in the interstellar medium. The um, gas is moving around just from, um, is just moving around. It has turbulent energy. And um, that's where the, the temperature comes from. Zero degrees, everything would be stopped <laughs> and not doing anything. Any other questions? Okay, no more questions. Well, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>